Okay, looks like we're getting ready to start. Great to uh, be with all of you. I see that there's 200 participants. That's quite a group that we have. And what we'll do is we'll talk about how those four A's of autism can help us create fulfilling and productive lives for autistic individuals. And in doing so, making that the rule rather than the exception. So let us uh, begin by unlocking those doors, opening those doors to creating fulfilling and productive lives. And this is brought to you by Shema Kaleno School, I Care for Autism, and let us begin. It begins by getting into the mind of the autistic individual. And that can start with the old game of what is the difference between the picture on the top and the picture on the bottom? And if you look at these pictures closely, as you focus on the details, uh, perhaps you'll begin to notice some of these differences. So for example, you might notice that one of the yellow footings on, the on one of the posts on the bottom is missing. Uh, this one here, this is three in a row on the bottom and there's four in the row on the top. And there's about a dozen more. Some of you might notice that the strap on the horse that's next to the zebra is blue on the bottom and red on the top. You also might notice that if you look at the floor that somebody left a quarter or some, something on the floor on the bottom, but not on the top. So as we consider these pictures, as we, as we, we consider the differences, here is the rest of them. And there's even a few more uh, to boot. So we've got about a dozen differences. And as we finish considering those differences, now it's time for a quiz. What is it a picture of? What is the animal in the foreground? These two questions are probably reasonably easy, or easy to answer. As we get to questions three and four, they become more difficult. So just to make sure that everybody can get an A because I believe in errorless learning, here we go. And now you've got all the answers. So the reason I bring this up is that had I not forced you to perceive these pictures like autistic individuals perceive the environment, you would have been able to answer these questions. I caused you to focus on detail detail at the expense of the whole. And for autistic individuals, that's often thought of as a deficit in central coherence and understanding the entirety of a situation because we do tend to focus on detail. However, as we consider detail-oriented thinking, other situations where it's advantageous to be detail-oriented. And things that often come to mind are uh, working in information technology, perhaps being an accountant, maybe being an investigator, maybe being a musician. So there's many, many situations where it's advantageous to be detail oriented. And it might even be possible to say that if we put a typical person in one of these positions or situations, that they have a deficit in detail-oriented thinking. And I bring this up because it's possible to take what we so often consider as challenges or weaknesses or deficits in autism and flip them around, turn them on their head, and now they become strengths. And that is an important key to unlocking fulfilling and productive lives for individuals on the autism spectrum. So when people ask me, what is my autistic child good at? Uh, whether it's a parent, whether it's a teacher, sometimes it's autistic people as well. And I respond to that question with yet another question. How do they spend most of their time? Because we tend to spend more time doing things we're good at. The things we're good at we spend more time doing. And if we consider what those strengths and abilities are, 
we can then start thinking about matching them to vocational and avocational possibilities, using them to find ways to develop interactions with others. So that requires reframing away from the typical definition of autism, deficits in social communication, restricted interests, repetitive motions, and so on, and just thinking of them as characteristics. Maybe they're characteristics that we can work with as opposed to against. So what I'm interested in is what are the abilities of the autistic individual? What are the interests? What kind of mind does the person have? So most people think that autistic individuals are, uh, are visually based. And I think most of us are, but the key word is most, not all. I know many autistic people are so non-visually based that they can't even read a map. But they're more word-based or kinesthetically based or musically based. So perhaps what we can say is that we can keep in mind that another characteristic of autism that's not often mentioned is the widely varying skill set. And what that translates to is that the things we're good at, we tend to be incredibly good at. And the things that we're not so good at, yes, we need, often need a lot of support. And there isn't much in the middle. So this brings to mind a colleague and friend of mine, Dina Gasner who is autistic and she's openly autistic so I can talk about her situation. She's a doctoral student at Adelphi University. It took me three years to convince her that she could do a doctoral degree and well, finally she applied and got in. She's done very well in her coursework and she's working on her dissertation. In fact, I think she's gotten all A's in her coursework except for two and those two are quantitative research and statistics. She and numbers just don't get along. So while she has incredible skills in reading, processing information, doing presentations, writing papers, she is so challenged by math that she's learned a long time ago not to even have a checkbook. Bounce too many checks. It's cash only for her. So she realizes this and she works with it and doesn't try to be a math person and doesn't even try to imitate someone who has an average ability in math. She knows that this is a challenge. And that's an example of the extremely widely varying skill set that us autistic people have. So, how does that translate to her in terms of research and doing doctoral work? Well, for her, out of sight is out of mind. Out of sight, out of mind is a good phrase for her. And how that translates is that when she does research, she has to have all of her research articles on every single flat surface that exists in her apartment. So whereas most people will have a pile of research articles on their desk right by their elbow and they th you know, thumb through these papers, as you're looking for whatever you need to look for. Uh, or some of you do the whole thing on the computer and you just open up the article that you need and you open up different ones until you find the one that fits what you're writing. For her, it's all gotta be out in the open. So there's some challenges in short-term memory as well. But again, she doesn't bemoan the fact that she has challenges in these areas, but she works with her strengths. And that's an example of working with the characteristics as opposed to against the characteristics of autism. It begins with language. So, so often we see these words to describe children who have special needs. They may be autistic, they may have other conditions, and this is what we often see. These words are spoken in teachers' rooms. If we see it on reports, it might it be that we could reframe how we judge individuals with learning differences with the words on the right. And so again, working with the characteristics of the individual on the autism spectrum. 
And that brings us directly into those four A's of autism. Four A's of autism. It begins with awareness. We've been at awareness for over a generation. You see the logos for Autism Speaks and the Autism Society of America. Those are just two of the many organizations that have been hammering away at autism awareness, making it so that we can recognize autism when it's in our midst, be it at home, in school, in, the, in employment, and in the community, to a point where we now recognize that autism occurs in one in 54 people. So that's a lot of autism. And what I tell educators is that if you don't have an autistic child in your classroom now, the numbers will catch up with you and you will have an autistic child in the next class. So awareness, you know, all this work on awareness builds a solid foundation for the next step, which is acceptance. And what acceptance means is that we accept the characteristics of autism and not something that we can change, but perhaps it's something we can work with. And often with parents, I see this happening when a child reaches the transi traditionally transition teenage years. When we begin to realize, or parents begin to realize that these autistic characteristics are here to stay, and maybe we could work with the characteristics instead of against them and help our child become the best autistic person it can be. So what's a good example? Let's think about grade school. We have an autistic child who is not motivated to do math. Maybe they're not so good at math. They just don't want to do it. So we do the uh, we do a favorite activity inventory, and we realize that this child loves to do nothing more than use a flight simulator on a computer. So now we've got a powerful reinforcer. And commonly a plan will be set up where if the child does whatever they need to do in math in an acceptable manner for the first 20 minutes of class, then they get the remaining 10 minutes to fiddle around on the flight simulator. The idea is that the flight, use of the flight simulator is a reinforcer and will motivate the child to do whatever they're expected to do. However, that's working against the characteristic of autism, characteristics, and specifically those highly focused interests. Uh, in a more pathological sense, we call them restricted interests, but let's think of them more positively. Focused interest, deep interest, or a passion. And we can use that flight simulator to teach mathematics. There's a lot of mathematics involved in flying airplanes. So that way, if we incorporate the flight simulator into the subject of math, now math becomes more intrinsically reinforcing. And what this acceptance stage does is it sets the stage for appreciation. And that is where autistic individuals are valued for what we can contribute to society. And we see this happening in IT firms already. Microsoft, SAP, Apple, Google, and many others actively seek autistic individuals as their employees because they know many of us can do things better, faster, and maybe just things that other people can't do. So, even though there may be challenges in employment or be, uh, having an autistic employee, they work with the characteristics and it becomes a good bottom line decision because again, there is this group of autistic people who can do IT geekery better than anybody else. Uh, however, it's also important to realize that whenever, at least whenever I hear about autistic geekery, in computer firms, what about everybody else? What about those of us who have skills in other areas such as music, writing, or wherever it may be? Fitness, sports. And we need to find meaningful employment for these individuals as well. And also the, every, the group of everybody else includes those individuals who have more challenges who are more significantly affected, who perhaps would be diagnosed 
these days with autism spectrum disorder or autism, autism spectrum, yeah, just autism spectrum, needing supports at level levels two and three. So this is the individual who perhaps needs support in communication, also in maintaining their schedule and getting from one place to another. So at this end, I know of a fellow in Florida who likes to do nothing more than fold hot laundry that's just come out of a dryer. And he folds faster and better than everybody else with perfect creases. I know many people who would like help with their laundry and he would love to help you with the, your laundry too. However, you have to pay him to do it because that is his job. That is what he does all day. Standing in a hot laundromat, folding clothes. He's enjoying it. He is fulfilled, he's productive, and he's appreciated for what he contributes to society. Which then brings our last of the four A's, which is action, the glue or the work that we need to put in to affecting these first three steps. Knowing when autism is in our midst, then working with as opposed to against the characteristics of autism, and then finally valuing what autistic people can bring to society. So my charge to you is what actions are you going to take to climb these stairs of awareness, acceptance, and appreciation of people with differences in your lives? And if you're an autistic person, what are you going to do to use your strengths to lead a fulfilling and productive life? So what brings me here to talk to you about autism? Let's take it from the beginning. Things were pretty typical at first. At 24 hours of age, my wife says, I look like Then at 18 months, like what happens to about 30% of us on the spectrum, the regressive autism bomb exploded, where I lost functional communication, had meltdowns, withdrew from the environment, and in brief, I became a very autistic little kid. There was so little known about autism in those days. Where does autism come from? What do we do about it? And now more people are asking, what can we do with autism? So as a result, it took my parents a whole year to find a place for diagnosis. And then when they did, the doctors said they had never seen such a sick child and they recommended institutionalization. But fortunately, my parents, like we see so many parents today and in increasing numbers, they advocated on my behalf. They convinced the school to take me in about a year. And it was during that year that my parents implemented what we would today call an intensive home-based early intervention program. And this was a program emphasizing music, movement, sensory integration, narration, and imitation. And that's just today's terminology. In those days, the concept of early intervention didn't even exist. So what did my parents do exactly? Well, first they tried to get me to imitate them and that didn't work. Now, many of us use imitation, whether we're educators, parents, or anytime you're teaching somebody something to do, whenever you show them, this is how you do it, now you do it, that's imitation. And most of the time it works. But for us autistic people, especially when young, perhaps due to, to a difference in mirror neurons, it just wasn't happening. So then my parents flipped it around and they imitated me. And once they did that, I became aware of them in my environment. And then they were able to move me along. And I think the key implication that as a prerequisite for doing authentic and solid work with an autistic person, you have to develop a trusting relationship first. Then you can move on. And I think that holds true for everybody else as well, not just for autistic individuals. So the work that they did, my parents, speech began to return at age four. As a result, I believe that we have the technology, we have the know-how, we have the wherewithal, so that we can turn away from the closed doors of disability disorder and deficit and look at the open doors of ability. And in that way, 
leading fulfilling and productive lives for autistic individuals can become the rule rather than the exception. And rather than being a bomb, autism now becomes da bomb. And how does autism become da bomb? That's when we match characteristics and strengths to individual situations. So let's take a look at someone like Robert, a young adult, probably was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, now would have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, needing supports at level one, he communicates very, very well. So let's take a look at these characteristics. And instead of calling them deficits in communication, social interaction, restricted interests, let's just consider them as they are. The communication characteristics of those of us who speak, we tend to be detailed, factual, data-driven, truthful, repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. I think you get the idea. But then again, when you get directions, you do want them in a detailed, factual uh, manner. How many of you have asked someone to repeat directions when you're lost? So I think this character, characteristic works. Now, what about social interaction? A brief greeting, a request for, uh, for directions, and then people say thank you and they go away. So this is working out pretty well. Robert is interacting in a way that he understands and it's also pretty repetitive, but it's working for him. And where does Robert get this information? His coworkers have to look it up in a reference. But for Robert, because this is one of his special interests as trains and transportation system information tend to be a very a common interest for autistic individuals, he's memorized all this information. And as a result, he can access this information much faster than his coworkers because he is autistic. And, then, and therefore he outperforms his typical coworkers who are not on the autism spectrum. So this is an example of how autism can become da bon. So getting back to my situation, I entered the school that initially rejected me at age, at age uh, two and a half. I got reevaluated. Instead of being considered as psychotic and ready for an institution, I got upgraded to neurotic. So things were moving up in the world. I also discovered the wonderful world of watch motors. I was found by my parents taking apart a watch with a sharp knife. I'd pop open the back, remove the motor, extract a few gears, spin them around and put it all back together again. And the watch still worked and there weren't any pieces left over. So incredible fine motor control to take apart a watch. But then where does that motor control go when it comes to penmanship? So I was always curious about that one. One of the worst experiences I could have in school would be to walk into a room with a paragraph on the board. Because what that meant, as it means for most elementary school children, is you're probably going to have to copy it down. And by the end of class, I had gotten through a few words and everybody else had gone to recess. Now, how could it be that I have the fine motor control to take apart a watch? However, it was a total flop in a disaster area when it came to penmanship, as so many of us are. And that's a question you can ask your favorite occupational therapist. Uh, there are some neurological reasons for this. In addition, what this also tells us or as a demonstration of the often sharp lines of demarcation between the abilities that autism gives us and the very real disabilities that autism can give us as well. We cannot deny them. Well, I do, I do promote a, a, uh, an abilities-based approach and a strength-based approach for working and supporting autistic individuals. We do have to be mindful that there are some real challenges that come with autism as well. And we do need to work with those challenges. However, we do still need to be supporting, the, finding and supporting those abilities. So my parents, they notice this, instead of looking at the closed door of disability disorder and deficit, they looked at the open door. 
of ability and soon provided all kinds of other devices to take apart and to put back together again. So they supported my interests. And uh, perhaps this interest could lead to a future area of study and maybe even employment as a watch repairman. I probably would have needed a lot of support in communication and living as an adult. Well, that's what it looked like at that time. But at least maybe this was something I could do. My parents making a big deal about this were building a sense of self-awareness. And I often find that lacking in autistic people. Just knowing what you're good at and where your challenges are. What does it mean to the autistic individual to be autistic? And what this does is it sets the stage for a good sense of self-determination or being able to make good adult decisions with an awareness of your strengths and challenges. So speaking of challenging behaviors, let's take a look at this middle school student, Arvind. He has limited speaking ability. He spends hours drawing shapes using crayons on, a big, on big pieces of paper. Even as a toddler, try to remove these drawing materials in hopes of forgetting him to exchange with the class and others. Avim screams, kicks, bites the back of his hand and exhibits other challenging behaviors. Unable to get Arvind to join his classmates, his teachers now just permit him to spend the day in the back of the room with his crayons and paper. And he just draws all day because any attempts to take them away so that he can focus on the class, it just doesn't go well at all. So what can we do to work with, not against, but with Arvind's desire to draw as a past social interaction. So instead of saying, all right, we're now gonna take this away, is there something we could do that involves the drawing? So this is a situation that I came across as I was called into a family to consult in Los Angeles. And when I arrived at the house, indeed there was their son, a middle school student who didn't speak very much. And he was just drawing at a table drawing all kinds of shapes. They seem pretty artistic as well. So uh, he didn't say much, he just kind of looked at me. I sat down at the other side of the paper. It's a big piece of uh, drawing paper, maybe butcher block paper or something, wrapping paper. And I started drawing as well. At my end, I found that I could draw pretty close to his objects and even right up against his objects that he was drawing. And he gave me a single look and just went back to work. I found that I could even color inside his drawings. And he was okay with that. How much communication did he have? Well, I was gonna find out. So I picked up a crayon and asked him what color it was. Okay, he correctly identified it, he identified many others. Okay, he's got his colors and he used words as well. I could also ask him to pick up a particular crayon, a color, and then give it to me to draw. So what that told me is that the way to work with Arvind was not to take this favorite activity away, but to work with this activity to build a relationship and to teach Arvind whatever he needed to be taught. If he needed to be taught to count, well, let's use crayons or art or maybe drawing numbers if that works. Interactions with others. Well, I would think uh, in an art class, it could be a lot of interaction. If Arvind was willing to share his drawing paper with me, maybe he'd be willing to share his drawing paper with others and increase social interaction. And why didn't Arvind have a meltdown? When I started working with him, maybe he sensed that I was not there to take away his drawing, but I was just there to enjoy his favorite activity with him. At age six, entering public school kindergarten, I was a social and academic catastrophe. You know what happens to people who are different in grade school? Fortunately, 
School systems now realize that bullying is not a developmental phase that people need to go through. And that increasing numbers of school systems in the United States are required to uh, submit anti-bullying plans on a regular basis to the State Department of Education. Academically, I was usually about a grade behind in most of my subjects. I would spend most of my elementary school days going into the library, getting books on my favorite subjects, such as space exploration or aviation, earthquakes, volcanoes, dinosaurs, whatever it was, reading them, taking notes, copying diagrams, and then putting them away and getting books on some other thing I was interested in. And sometimes I even wondered, is there more to school than just reading books on my favorite subjects, maybe doing reading in groups or math with others? However, I think what this translated to is that teachers didn't quite know how to reach me, but since I wasn't a behavior problem, they just left me to my own devices. It was probably for better rather than for worse because there was so little known about autism in those days. I suppose repeating the letter B incessantly uh, didn't endear me to my classmates either. Now, these days we know a lot more about number one, educating autistic individuals and how to uh, better interact with others. And at the same time, educating others, whether it's classmates or coworkers or the community at large, how to better be with autistic individuals. So this brings to mind the idea of transition. The federally mandated transition age, as we start thinking about what the child is going to do as an adult at graduation is 16. Now this number would be much better if we just took that one away and started transition at age six. Why is it that we'd only spend a two or three years figuring out what a child's going to do for the rest of their lives? And I think transition should start actually as soon as we know that somebody's on the autism spectrum. So back to my situation, taking part watches at age six, uh, not that I'm destined to be a watchmaker and I ended up doing other things, but at least maybe that's something that I could do. And it's important to be, to keep in mind, you know, what, how can today's interests and skills translate to potential future areas of study or employment later on? So now we're moving up to age eight. I would spend hours cracking open small rocks with a big rock. I was fascinated by the shiny specks inside, sharp edges. And that eventually grew into an interest in geology, geography, many others. I remember as I had a stack of astronomy books on my desk at this time, a teacher told me that I'd never learn how to do math, but somehow I figured out just enough math to teach statistics at the university level. Now, these days, I'd see more educators noticing interests like this and then find a way to work, in this case, astronomy into mathematics. Or well, maybe it's the other way around, mathematics into astronomy. That way, making the subject of math more intrinsically reinforcing. Teachers were telling my parents that I didn't know how to read. My parents said, what are you talking about? You're reading the newspaper at home. So again, working with the interest, helping the autistic person be the best autistic person they can be, as opposed to a poor imitation of a non-autistic person. Interests and strengths. We all learn better about what we're interested in. If we're interested in something, we're probably good at it too. And for autistic individuals, it's just to a much greater degree. Bicycles started becoming interesting to me. I got it to a point where I could take a bicycle apart down to the ball bearings and put that back together again. So at this time, speech is pretty much uh, typical on par with everybody else. Well, maybe I could be a bicycle mechanic. That could be a good way to earn money. And had things gone a little bit differently, 
maybe I'd be managing a bike shop at this time or owning a bicycle shop at this time. Oh, let's take a look at another challenging behavior. Here we've got Greg. He's an elementary school child. Doesn't speak yet. And he loves balls. If he finds a ball, he'll throw it. And he's the type of kid who will even find a ball in a closed door or somewhere out of sight. If you try to take it away, you get a catastrophic meltdown. It only happens with these favorite objects. I know many autistic people who have particular objects, just something that they're incredibly attracted to, or it could be an interest as well. And trying to keep them away from it, it just doesn't go well. So it's written in his educational plan that all balls be kept out of sight. His teachers aren't always successful in doing so. As a result of this type of behavior, he's considered one of the school's most difficult students. So what can we do, again, to work with Greg in his interests? Getting away from uh, identifying this ball as a reinforcer and then taking it away. And maybe that's what leads to a lot of challenging behaviors is that we take things away and make the child earn them back. Now, there may be some situations where that's appropriate. However, I believe the more that we can work with a particular interest or object, the better off we'll be. So maybe what I would do is I would borrow from strategies of the Miller method at millermethod.org. And I would come into the room with a whole sack of balls, big ones, little ones, dozens of them, different colors, different materials. And I immediately hand one of these objects to Greg and say, here, you grab it, you throw it. And I do it again. And I keep doing it until we develop a routine or in Miller method speak, a system. And once he's, once he's absorbed the system, you might say, and he's just taking balls from me and he's throwing them, maybe I can start making little changes or system expansions. Maybe I'll present the ball in a different, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different location. Maybe different colors, different weights, different materials. Maybe I'd even, present the ball close to my face. And that way Greg would have to orient to me to grab the object. Maybe I could then move on to using these objects as teaching materials to teach colors, categorization, counting, taking this object and giving it to another person or going to another person and getting one of these objects. Maybe shaping the behavior to throw these balls into a basket. Maybe this is a precursor to basketball. So in other words, I'm using this favorite object as a way to develop a relationship with Greg. And once we have this trusting relationship, I can go on to teaching Greg whatever he needs to be taught. Special interests. Now, this is a common de definition I used to see. And you may know people like this. And this is an all-consuming interest of such great intensity that it interferes with daily functioning. However, that's looking at a special interest from a deficit point of view. Now, what if we use, look at this from an ability-based point of view? An interest of such great intensity that it provides powerful motivation to learn mathematics, maybe other curriculum, to explore or to explore career opportunities. Now, these are some of my special interests. They come and they go. Sometimes there's more than one of them at a time. Make sure you get them all because there will be a quiz at the end. At age 10, I was awfully concerned about the letter E. Because I heard you have to drop E before adding ING. I had a friend who said he felt like a pizza. Well, he didn't look like one, he didn't smell like one, so there were some issues there. 
I also remember a session being interrupted by an announcement. The principal had lost his mother. And that made me think about what my parents would tell me when I lost something. And they would always say it was in the last place he left it, which I always thought was a silly thing to say because if I knew that, I wouldn't ask them. However, I thought if that was good enough for my parents to tell me probably thousands of times, I could be helpful to the principal who I liked and wanted to help and suggest that if he thought really hard as to where he last saw his mother, maybe he could find her. Well, that didn't go over well at all because lost your mother, well, that's an idiot. It means she passed away, which is yet another idiot. So we have to go through two idioms to get to the fact that his mother died. Uh, however, for me, I was interpreting the, the situation very literally. We take, if it looks like we're being disrespectful or rude or not respecting authority, talking back, and maybe that we're interpreting the situation very literally. And that may be because we have difficulty perceiving the nonverbal cues that make up to maybe 93% of the total interaction package. And it's these cues that inform us when someone's telling a joke, using sarcasm, or engaging in an idiom. And this gets into the concept of the hidden curriculum. So what is the hidden curriculum? These are all the rules that nobody talks about. They're considered just understood. And it's hidden because nobody sees them until you smack up against a social blunder, such as my situation, suggesting to the principal that if he thought hard as to where he last saw his mother. Well, there's certain things to say when you hear that somebody has lost a parent or lost someone they love. And not too many people talk about what you do. People just kind of know what to do. It's assumed knowledge. And likewise, for students in school or an employee handbook, uh, they aren't there. Uh, they're not written. So we need direct instruction. You ask one of us to hold the door and we may be wondering why you want us to hold the door. But really it means something else. You tell your student you're gonna to get to them in a minute. Well, guess who's counting the seconds? And if you're not there in 60 seconds, well, there may be a problem. And that's what also leads to black and white thinking. And again, there may be good situations where it's, it's positive to be thinking in black and white. And whereas others, it may be important to have various shades of gray. You don't need to be autistic to have difficulties in middle and high school. But for me, it was actually easier because I discovered the band room. An interest being a focused interest music being a focused interest for me, I joined the band. Now I had a structured activity in which to mediate my interactions with others. And in fact, I got so fascinated with music that I got it into my autistic head that I needed to learn how to play all the instruments, every last one of them. So that translated into hours in the instrument closet, discovering different instruments, taking them apart, sometimes recombining two or three instruments into contraptions that shouldn't have seen the light of day. And while I didn't learn all the instruments, I did get it up to about 15. And then when I heard that one of the requirements for a degree in music education was that you needed to learn all the instruments, well, that just seemed to be the thing to do. And that's part of the reason that I give music lessons to autistic children. Because in addition to all the therapeutic benefits of engaging in music, you're also developing a real life skill in which to uh, interact with others, make friends, get involved in the community as a musician. Also, music is just plain old fun. And then finally, I haven't figured out how to teach typical kids yet. 
So I just stick with the autistic ones. They seem to make a lot more sense, or at least to me. However, it's also important to realize that music is a very sensory type of activity. I remember skipping a lot of jazz band rehearsals because as a trombone player, the harpets were just too loud. They were seated behind us. And no amount of discussion or cajoling or arguing with the band director seemed to help the situation. So I'd skip. So that brings to mind, what do you do when an autistic person is doing something that you don't want them to do? It's a challenging behavior. Skipping class. So we don't want students skipping class, autistic or otherwise. So what is the reason behind it? We have to do a good functional behavior assessment. What is the function behind the behavior? And we need to take a look at what they may be. So for example, do I not like jazz? Well, if I don't like jazz, that has a particular solution. Maybe I don't like the band director. That has another solution. Maybe I don't like my classmates. Yet another way to resolve that issue. Maybe I don't like my instrument because it needs cleaning and it smells and it's gross. Well, it was none of the above. And until you figure out what the issue is, you're not gonna be able to correct the problem. Well, one day I marched into the principal's office with a set of alternate seating charts and demanded he make a change. Well, that didn't work. Uh, however, fortunately now, one, I know a lot more about effective skills and self-advocacy. And then number two, uh, there's a lot more known about autism and potential sensory issues. So, uh, so with music, how do you teach an autistic person music. Well, let's take a look at some of the things I do uh, when I teach a child, in this case, a child who is non-speaking, but still he can learn to read and play music. Ethan, come over here. You want me to start? A, B, C, D, E. For autistic people who were diagnosed when autism was unknown, there was little support. Their parents, for the most part, were on their own. Take an A. Take an A from here. We eventually get to a stage where, without talking about it, he's reading music. So when we get to piano book number one, he'll already know how to read it and understand it. It'll be friendly. I remember having piano lessons, lessons at age six. And I think the best thing that I learned from this, from these music lessons was how not to teach children on the autism spectrum how to play music. I think the goal of intervention is to help that person be a fulfilling and productive life with the strengths that they have. The potential of those of us with autism is like the potential of anybody else. It's unlimited. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what I do regarding the teaching of music. More on that perhaps in a future webinar. Now let's take a look at Robert. Robert, who we looked at a little bit earlier, he is the young adult who gives public transportation system information to the lost patrons. Now he revels in this job, he loves doing it because of his interest in trains and transportation systems. He, he works flawlessly, but he talks a little bit too fast and the patrons are unable to keep up. So what is a plan for employing Robert's desire to share this information at a slower speed and what might you do as a supervisor to implement this plan? Well, there's many options available to us. And whenever we want to teach something, 
we already have the tools available. And depending upon how the person communicates, maybe you'd use a visual schedule, maybe a social story, perhaps a power card, maybe cartooning, maybe video modeling, maybe role play. So these are all possibilities that Robert's supervisor could engage in in order to get him to slow down when he's speaking. Maybe little reminders on post-it stickers uh, at his station, that's possible too. So these are things that we need to consider. Role-playing, maybe the supervisor giving directions to Robert, but talking too fast. So he gets an idea of what it's like. Uh, maybe reading directions off together so that Robert can get a good feeling as to the pace in which he should speak. So these are just some ideas that we could engage in to help Robert do a better job. So speaking of jobs, this represents my first formal job. I had a paper route uh, when I was younger. And I thought it was really good because it uh, was a full business and kid-sized format. And you had to learn the responsibilities of doing a job and doing it well, and doing it whether you wanted to or not. I mean, those papers had to be delivered every day and they had to be delivered in a certain manner. And then you have to go around and collect payment from all the customers and keep track of all this money going in and out. So this, my first job cleaning tables at a busy restaurant, that didn't work well at all. The restaurant was a basket full of sensory violations. And I realized that I needed to do something else and that I needed to make a change in plans. And sometimes we get involved in things that just aren't working, so we have to figure out a better way to go about it. So enter the bicycles. Again, at age eight, I started getting interested in bicycles to the point where I could build a bicycle up from the ball bearings. And at this time, I had built my own bicycles. Uh, yeah, several bicycles. And one of them I was particularly proud of. Uh, I built uh, every last piece of it, including the wheels, taking the hub, the spokes, and the rim, and then putting it all together to make a wheel. Uh, I got on this bicycle, and I made the rounds of all the bike shops in the area. There were about a dozen of them. I'd go into the shop, I'd locate the manager or the supervisor, and I'd nerd into my bicycle, talking bicycle geekery with them. And then after a period of, a period of time, I would ask him for a job. Now, it took about 11 times on the 12th time, I was able to turn away from the closed door of what didn't work and look at the open door of what does work. I got a job as a bicycle mechanic. And at first I was asked, I guess on a somewhat of a trial basis, to build 10 bicycle wheels. All right, well, I could do that, no problem. And that's exactly what I did. And with a job like this, I could, uh, I could manage my sensory input by working in the back, fixing bicycles, a much quieter situation, doing something that I enjoyed doing, or I could come up to the front and perseverate on bicycles to people who walked in. Although I think people called that uh, selling bicycles. So that worked out really well. And ha again, had things gone differently, maybe I'd still be in a bicycle shop fixing bicycles or uh, maybe running a bicycle shop or doing something related to bicycles. So on to college. College was a utopia. I had more friends. If I wanted to ride my bicycle at midnight, I could find someone just as strange as I was to also ride at midnight. There were no more bullies. Horses were more interesting. Dating occurs in college, which was also uh, quite confusing to say the least. Never quite could figure it out, was never really interested anyways. However, in my undergraduate days, I remember after spending a lot of time with this lady, 
that she suddenly told me that she likes hugs and back rubs. Now, what I thought was, well, gee, I've got this brand new friend and she doubles as a source of deep pressure like a Temple Grandin squeeze machine. Well, I guess she had other ideas. And after a lot of conversation, I realized that she wanted to be my girlfriend. However, I wasn't interested in dating or at least not dating her at that point. However, what that also made me realize is that this, there was this whole area of communication that we call nonverbal. And again, research suggests that nonverbal communication makes up to 93% of the total interaction package. So I found this fascinating, almost like a secret way of decoding what people really meant. But as a result, I'd spend hours reading books on body language, relationships like dating for dummies. And I was building a lexicon of nonverbal communication and also understanding about relationships. So then we fast forward some years later, now it's graduate school. And I'm spending a lot of time with this lady, initially reviewing each other's homeworks, and then progressing to doing things socially. And one day at a beach, very much like this, she suddenly gave me a kiss, a hug, and held my hand. Now I have the social story down. And it went something like this. If a woman hugs you, kisses you, and holds your hand all at about the same time, it probably means they want to be a girlfriend. And if that's the case, you better have an answer right away. And it could either be yes, it could be no, or it could be further investigation and analysis is indicated. Well, it seemed to be a good thing to do. And if you want to find out more about what this is like on her side of the spectrum, then I encourage you to read her contributions to my autobiography. And now as an adult, I spend most of my time in a sheltered workshop for people with Asperger's syndrome, where we perseverate on subjects for months, years, and entire lifetimes, and talk about them incessantly, and make other people listen. Sometimes community intera interaction between uh, community members could be improved. Some people refer to this place as a university. If you want to find undiagnosed people on the spectrum, I encourage you to just check out your professors. That's where we are. So anyways, college, as an undergraduate, it worked really well. Fixing bicycles became a great way to earn money. Uh, I plastered the campus with signs just like this. Soon I'd have half a dozen or a dozen bicycles in my side of the dorm room in various stages of assembly. And I could spend all day fixing bicycles and come out at the end of the day with uh, maybe a couple of hundred dollars, which was much better, more interesting and more lucrative than doing a work study job as a security guard or working in the dining commons. Well, I was telling my sister about this, who's four years older than I am. And she said, well, what does your roommate have to say about this? And uh, my roommate always seemed fine about it, as I told her. Well, he seems fine. He hasn't said anything. And besides, all these bicycles are on my side of the room. Well, they, she then said, well, what does your roommate like to do? So she had a plan. Oh, well, he's a photographer. Oh, he's a photographer. How would you feel if your roommate had all kinds of camera equipment and developing fluids and all kinds of uh, tripods and whatnot scattered about his side of the room. And this is where asking a typical question to an atypical person doesn't work. And my response was, well, I'd, I'd probably be very interested in taking them apart and figuring out how they learn. Uh, I guess that was the wrong answer. Finally, she pulled older sister rank and said, get the bicycles out of the room. So I moved them to the, uh, to the student lounge. And the, there they were. They still fixed bicycles. So fixing bicycles was definitely a good thing to know how to do. And speaking of employment, 
as we think about employment for people throughout the spectrum. Again, it's matching characteristics and job attributes to possible positions. We've got someone who is, doesn't speak very much, but has a need for order in their lives. Could they be someone who stocks shelves, keeps books where they belong in a library? Unusual response to sensory stimulation. Sensory issues are a part of autism. And just like the fellow who we talked about earlier, who likes to fold laundry, he's getting some sensory input from that. I remember uh, talking to a lady in Japan who had a teenager who didn't speak very much either. And she was wondering what could he do? So I asked him, what does he like to do? Well, I found that he likes to go to the basement, stick his finger under a faucet, turn the water on and spray water all over the place. And there had already been a couple of floods, but this is what he liked to do. So again, let's work with the characteristic. He's getting some kind of sensory input from pressing his thumb up against a faucet while water comes out, maybe deep pressure on the thumb, maybe he gets a nice visual of the water spraying, maybe the sound, whatever it is, he likes spraying water at high pressure. So let's find a way to work with it. What are some situations where you spray water at high pressure? Being a fireman, for example. Well, that might not work too well because as a fireman, you have to have good communication skills, both expressive and receptive. He's not there yet. So that won't quite work, but maybe washing cars power washing buildings, sidewalks. These might be some things that he likes to do. Things that might bore other people out of their minds, but him is enjoying it. So there are many facets in which uh, we can look at for matching characteristics to job attributes into possible positions. Uh, I care for autism as an Autism at Work initiative where we've been doing a lot of work in terms of finding employment and matching employment possibilities for autistic, no, two autistic individuals. So maybe more about that in a future webinar. So even rituals and compulsions, for example, attention to detail. So inspecting objects, making sure that they're perfect. And as we think about employment as part of those four A's of autism, from, accept, from awareness to acceptance and appreciation, let's take a look at some examples from Coulter videos where uh, Dan Coulter, who is also on the autism spectrum, uh, follows six people, all on the autism spectrum, all working, and all of them using their strength to contribute something to their employer that, that goes beyond what other people are able to provide, or a typical person is able to provide. So as you look through these, as you watch these uh, quick vignettes, uh, think about what are the strengths of this autistic person? Strengths that being on the autism spectrum perhaps have given them and how have their employers found ways to match those strengths to needs of their organization? When we talk about jobs for people with Asperger's syndrome, let's be clear, we're not talking about charity. Please, sir, may I have a job? The employees in this video are productive workers who earn their pay. Listen to comments from their bosses and coworkers. Judy Carter is Director of Accounts Payable at Infor Global Solutions and the head of Kevin Singh's department. Kevin is very detailed, uh, fast. Kevin is a very, very intelligent person. If you give him an assignment, he can perform this better than anyone in our department. In Kevin's job at this time, he does double of what the other auditors do. 
he is fast, he's meticulous, he's detailed, and he takes pride in his work. Sheila Wagner is the assistant director of the Emory Autism Center and Katie Rogers' supervisor. Katie is invaluable to Monarch program. Um, I, as well as a colleague of mine in this program, uh, do a lot of traveling to schools throughout the state of Georgia. Um, we call in a panic stage sometime in, in St. Katie. We really have got to get this out to this, this particular school before two o'clock, before the students are dismissed. Um, we need to send it home with a particular student. And she rushes around and gets the things that we need and gets some facts out for us. Um, she's very good at that. She's very well versed with the internet and with all the databases that are out there. She's uh, one of the best employees we have. Sarah Kuntz is the head of the Collections Management Branch of the North Carolina State Archives, where Richard Blanks works. Gina Fry is Richard's direct supervisor in their imaging group. Uh, Richard has a great attention to detail, and um, he also has a very good knowledge of history, which is helpful in our, um, in our line of work. Um, he also is very dedicated to what he does. He's able to go through lots and lots of pages and he finds things that even other people have missed as far as order goes. He can sit there for long periods of time doing the same thing. If I could hire four or five more riches, I would do it in a heartbeat because he gets so much work done. He's an easy person to supervise. He doesn't even really sit around and chit chat. <laughs> Kathleen Wheelis is a reference librarian and Drew Coulter's supervisor at the Forsyth County Library. Drew's attention to detail is the thing that got him the job. We want those books to be on the shelves in perfect order. And that's not easy to accomplish. It's easy to make mistakes. We have special collections where we want a particular book in a particular part of the library. And Drew's attention to detail is wonderful. Linda Parson is an accounting technician at Teach, and David Moser's co-worker. David is very good with numbers. He says, we work in accounting. He has the information in his head. Whereas I have to look on a piece of paper. David knows things that I don't even remember. If I have a receipt, David, here's the last four digits. This card is this, and he knows it. I mean, it's amazing what he retains as far as names and numbers and things like that. Sean Gatesman is the manager of the Heartland Veterinary Clinic, and Tori Sailor's supervisor. Well, Tori is not supposed to be your average employee, right? Well, she isn't because she's above average when it comes to that. I mean, the girl just puts her head down and gets it done, you know, and that is definitely, I mean, that's why we made her the department lead, because she is willing to embrace what she's doing, enjoy doing it, and not let the little things slow her down or mess up her day. And that's important. These employees are doing great work, but that doesn't mean things have been easy for them. As a group, they're dealing with many of the same challenges others with Asperger's syndrome face. Maybe some with two face. But they've found the right jobs where they can use their abilities and overcome or work around their challenges. So as you saw, there were six people with Asperger's syndrome, six people on the autism spectrum. Uh, a lot of them doing uh, kind of geeky-ish type things. And again, uh, that is a stereotype. We're not all geeky, IT-ish number people, uh, which is why it's good to have Tori at the end there uh, showing her expertise uh, with animals. So what we can say is that whatever the interest, whatever the skill is, it's probably going to be to some sort of extreme. And again, let's find a way to work with as opposed to against this, uh, this ability. When we talk about jobs for people- Oh, we heard that already. Let's go to the next one. So if you're interested in more employment type stuff, I also encourage you to check out neurodiversity in the workplace. Uh, take a screenshot of this uh, link here because what it does is it leads you to, and here we go a curriculum that a colleague and I developed for a, a number of IT geeks. Yeah, here they are, modules. Uh, young adults who are interested in working for SAP. 
And we had a dozen young adults on the autism spec. And the, we taught them everything they needed to know, or at least as much as we could, about finding and keeping a job, not how to do their IT work, because they knew a lot more about it, that than either of us could ever hope to. And while SAP was expecting to hire about half or a dozen of these students, uh, they ended up hiring them all, every last one of them, all 24. And five years later, every one of those uh, were then students, candidates, uh, happily employed at SAP except for one. And the reason why that one is not still employed is because he was a, uh, he had moved to the other side of the country. All right, so here we are again. And so these are some of the areas that we cover. And I also encourage you to look more into what's being done at I Care for Autism in terms of employment, should you have interest in that area. So anyways, uh, that uh, curriculum that uh, I showed you the website of, uh, it's available for free. We decided that it should be open source. So available to everybody, use it as you see fit, just give proper, uh, uh, proper citation in terms of doing so. And, uh, these are the two protagonists who are involved in making this uh, program, uh, me being one of them, and Dr. Robert Seif, who has an adult son on the autism spectrum as well. So as we uh, close out the formal part of the presentation, I ask you to think about whether autism is a serious series of disorders, deficits, and disabilities, or is it a set of abilities? And what are you going to do to transform what might be considered a weakness or a challenge into a strength? And I've listed some challenges on the left, things that are often seen as weaknesses, challenges, or even pathological. And then on the right, people with these very characteristics have been able to turn them around and use them as strengths. Uh, last time I checked, uh, I haven't found an employee yet, an employer yet, who doesn't appreciate when their employees, when their employees show up to work every single day. So as we go about promoting the four A's of autism, uh, acceptance, or I should say, uh, starting with awareness, knowing that there are now one in 54 people are on the autism spectrum and being able to recognize that at home, in school, at work, and in the community. And from there, moving on to acceptance and working with the characteristics of autism. And we have a choice, either we can try to make the autistic person a poor imitation of a non-autistic person, or we can help that autistic person be the best autistic person they can be. And then on to appreciation. We we're seeing ever increasing numbers of autistic individuals being valued for what we can contribute to society. Temple Grandin, probably the most well-known autistic person is valued for what she contributes to the cattle processing industry, to the point where if you eat beef, there's a greater than 50% chance that the beef that you last ate, whether it was a hamburger or a steak or whatever it was, was processed in a plant that was designed by Temple Grandin. She's, well, she's better known in the cattle processing industry than she is in the autism world. So that's an exa another example of appreciating what autistic people can bring to society. And then finally, the action piece, which is number four. What, are we, what work are we doing to glue those three A's together? So as we consider success, I believe that if you have someone who's productive and fulfilled with their life, then they're probably successful. As the person moves through their journey in life from activity to activity, from goal to goal, and when we think about measuring success, 
And it's important to realize that it's an individual type of situation. What I mean by that is that I often see people comparing their success with somebody else's or someone they support with somebody else's. And since everybody has different journeys and, and unique situations, I think the better way to look at it is that if we can get an autistic person through a class, through a session, through a job sam sampling program, a community outing, or whatever it is, and if they learn even just one small thing about better and more successfully interacting in their environment, then that's a success for them. And likewise, for all of you here, a little bit more than 200 people who came today, so it's great to see so many people uh, in the audience. If you've learned even one small thing about better understanding autistic individuals and how you can help an autistic individual lead a fulfilling and productive life through these four A's in autism, then that's a success for all of you as well. I wanna thank you for your participation and your efforts that go into promoting fulfilling and productive lives for autistic individuals. Again, as the rule rather than the exception, we now have some time for questions and um, if for some reason we don't get to your question today, or if you suddenly think of a question after this session is over, then certainly feel free to contact me at drstephenshore.com. So now I think is a great time to answer some questions. So I see a bunch of questions in the chat. So somebody asked me, we'll do some of the easy ones first. Uh, where am I based? I am based at Delphi University. Uh, so you can also reach me there. Somebody said, hello from Kuwait. So uh, hello back to Kuwait. I've been to Kuwait once and I uh, look forward to when I can return to Kuwait. Uh, it's at the Kuwait Autism Center. They had a big world autism organization um, conference uh, some years ago. And I enjoyed that very much. And somebody else asked, is one in 54 in USA or worldwide? So one in 54 is in the United States. Uh, I think the numbers are similar wherever I go. Uh, some countries I find have counted similar numbers, others have not quite gotten quite to counting yet. Um, how did my parents include my sister in your journey? Well, my sister was often a great support, four years older than I am. Uh, and. Uh, so she often was a helper. However, uh, when an autistic person has siblings, and while they can be great helpers, it's also important to make sure that you know, the, uh, the sibling of the autistic child has time to just be an autistic child. So that's, uh, that's important as well. Uh, 
what advice do you have for an 18 year old girl who struggles to socially communicate? I think it all begins with interest. What does this 18 year old girl like to do? So for example, I had trouble with social interaction. But I had this strong interest in bicycles. So I joined a bicycling club. And there I found a bunch of people who were interested in the same thing I was. We had a common interest. And likewise, with music. That is uh, also how I met my wife. Uh, somebody asked if they could have the presentation slides. I encourage anybody who wants a copy of the slides to email me, and I will then send you a living, PDF, uh, living color PDF. I'd be glad to do that. Um, how much input does an autistic individual have in their transition? Somebody asked. Uh, I think I'm not enough, actually. Uh, there should be more. Every child should be involved in their individual education plan to the extent of their ability. And that can range from just simply walking in, saying hello to a few people, and leaving. That's all of 30 seconds. And I've seen it go all the way to where that autistic individual researches into their own accommodations and provides suggestions. So for example, an autistic person might say, no, I don't need extra time to do my math quizzes, but the scratching of student pencils and the coughing and the chair scraping are just so loud I can't concentrate. I need a quiet room instead. So that can, uh, that's something to look at. Um, how do you feel about ABA methodology for early intervention? I believe ABA methodology uh, is a solid tool, a solid, one of many solid tools for early intervention. And so that's another webinar that, and that's a look. And the key is to match approaches to individual needs. There are some students where ABA is going to work just great. And that's absolutely what you should use. And then there are others who will do much better with floor time or Miller method or daily life therapy or some other approach or perhaps even a mix of approaches. Perhaps even what's more important is having a skilled therapist, a skilled person to support and educate the child. Uh, that might be even the most important. Uh, let's see. Uh, as a person of faith, how do you perceive the intersection of religion with your four A's? Uh, religion is important to me, and it's important to many people. I know many people where religion is very important. And uh, if you want to find out more about uh, details on uh, religion, I encourage you to uh, email me directly. We can talk more about it. And likewise, like with the typical population, uh, there are many autistic people who have no interest in religion and want to have nothing to do with it and are actively against religion. Somebody asked if I have distance learning. Well, uh, I am a professor at Delphi University and due to the pandemic, every single course is distance learning. So come check me out at the Delphi University uh, where we have specific courses on autism and uh, special education. In, uh, in general, uh, Magdalena also said she just works with autistic children, uh, just following her instincts. They can go a long way. My mother followed her instincts. Uh, so combining instincts with knowledge of different strategies, I think can be very, very powerful. Uh, let's see, what else? Many, many questions. If somebody wants to have the email, um, sshore at adelphi.edu. Uh, now well, I'm looking at, it looks like three attendees have raised their hand. So let's see, I'm not sure how that works. Probably better just to type things in. Uh, let's see. 
So I'm flipping back and forth between the Q&A and the chat in general. Oh, somebody typed in my email address. Okay, that's very good. Again, I encourage you to email me if you have more questions that we don't get to, or they just come another way. They come much later. Uh, somebody asked more about my thoughts on different approaches. Again, match reasoned approaches to individual needs. And uh, maybe that will be the topic of the next webinar, uh, different approaches and how we can start to sort them out. Uh, somebody from the Philippines, advice to wives who have hubbies in the spectrum. Well, my wife has a hubby in, who is on the autism spectrum. I suggest you look up a book that's called The Other Half of Asperger's Syndrome. That's the name of it. And it's a very, it's a very small book, but a very helpful book. The Other Half of Asperger's Syndrome. Uh, go to amazon.com, type it in, and it will pop right up. Uh, somebody asked if Asperger's is it still a diagnosis. Uh, no, it's not in the United States, but the word remains very popular. People use it a lot, so people will understand what you're saying if you use the word Asperger's syndrome. Um, somebody asked if I've worked on a team with a therapeutic recreation specialist. Uh, no, I never have. Might be worth uh, looking into. Always interested in checking out different strategies. Is the hidden curriculum a workbook? Uh, as far as I know, it isn't, but it's uh, really good. Uh, it's a really good book. Maybe someone uh, could uh, turn some into a book. Oh, we have a son who freaks out when anyone brings him socially. He sees it as an interruption. Uh, I would think uh, practicing social interactions. He's at level one. Uh, that could be role play, could be, uh, could be power cards, cartooning, video modeling. Uh, these are some things that just come to mind at the moment. We have a 13 year old child who's obsessed with PlayStation, Fortnite, and video games. Yeah, that's pretty common. Uh, so, then, what are some ways that we could use that obsession as a launch pad to develop interactions with others? Are there things that we could look into or we could research in terms of some aspects of, the, of that video game, and maybe how they're produced? Uh, so, I would use whatever the interest is. Uh, and use that as a launch pad to exploring other things. A person who's not motivated. So I'd be interested in what does motivate that particular person. Let's see, two new messages way on the bottom. Oh, the other half of Asperger syndrome. Okay, yeah, thanks Joshua for writing that in. Uh, let's see, do I run any courses in London? Somebody asked. I, yeah, actually, I do teach a course, uh, co-teach a course with the uh, vice dean of, of the NYU Steinart School uh, in London every um, other January. So we're not doing it this January. We're not scheduled to do it. Probably couldn't do it anyways due to the pandemic. But we do plan on being back in London at, at live and in person uh, in January of 2022. Uh, let's see, let's uh, take a look. There's, there's some other questions. Uh, somebody enjoyed my singing as part of the Miracle Project of One Breath. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was really, really cool. Uh, that was the social story somebody asked, me, what is it? The social story is used, you know, developed by Carol Gray, and is used to explain why we do what we do in a 
social situation. And what I encourage you to do is to look up social stories online to find many, many examples. And I do have a presentation on the hidden curriculum, which will maybe come up in a future webinar where we get deeper into social stories. Well, let's see, how would you recommend going about helping learners get jobs in third world countries? I think it would be a matter of uh, seeing what needs to be done in those third world countries, just like anywhere. And what are some jobs? What, what are jobs that exist? And then how do we match that to individuals on the autism spectrum? And uh, let's see, somebody's a teacher of an autistic child. He's confusing, the child is confusing 48 and 84. It sounds like a little dyslexia to me. So I'd look into support for people who are dyslexic to help such a student. Now yeah, let's see what else. A number of questions. Again, uh, good to see so many people here. So we still have uh, almost 200, 195 people. Now, again, if you want presentation slides, you should email me and then I will send you a living color PDF. Let's see, any other questions that people might have? Thank you. Uh, the matter of, uh, uh, one way that can be helpful is the use of cartooning. And what cartooning does is that um, you have two types of bubbles. You have a thought bubble, which looks like a cloud, and you have a speech bubble. Uh, which is more of a straight line. We tend to be rectangular in nature uh, with uh, rounded edges. And so, for example, you might have one person saying to the other, uh, what's up, dog? And uh, then the other person might interpret it literally. Why are you calling me a dog? I am not a dog. But in fact, sometimes students call each other dog or people call each other dog just because it's it, it, it's a fun thing to do, almost sort of like a nickname, a term of endearment, uh, calling somebody else a dog. But it's not making fun of another person, it's not being mean or rude, uh, it's just an idiom that people use. So cartooning can be very helpful with something like that. And further work on learning figurative language might be to send the autistic person on a YouTube hunt and look for examples of where figurative language is being used and bring it back to one of the sessions that you have with them. Or if they're not at that point, then in partnership with that autistic person, let's look at some videos and see where things are being discussed, now presented literally or figuratively and how do we determine between the two. Now, let's see what else. Now, well, somebody says the more you learn, the more you need to under, know to understand behaviors. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Magdalena is absolutely right. The more we know about autism, the more we find out we don't know about autism. And that's everybody including autistic people. How do you reassure a parent when their baby might be on the spectrum? What type of resources are available for parent awareness? The first thing I would do is I hop online right away and start asking and do a search for autism support groups. It might be a chapter, 
this person is in the United States and might be a chapter of Autism Speaks or the Autism Society of America in their state, or perhaps even in the city or near the city where they live, if they're in another country, uh, you can still do an online search and still get support, maybe online. Most people are getting support online anyway due to the pandemic, so it doesn't matter where you are. My 14-year-old son is struggling in school. It's too noisy and distracting. He says he can't learn. Well, one thing is, that's good is that a 14-year-old son is aware that they're unable to learn and is having difficulty due to the environment. So one thing I would do is uh, have a good assessment done by an occupational therapist to get a sensory profile. And then in terms of dealing with the noise, uh, perhaps uh, using ear protection can be helpful. Uh, the recording or the slides available today. Uh, yeah, the recording, I believe, will become available. And the slides are available. And anyone who wants the slides, you just email me. And I'll send you a copy of the slides in living PDF color. And we got an, an encouraging comment from uh, Karen, uh, her son has PDDNOS and is very intelligent. So that's a very important statement because autism, being on the autism spectrum doesn't necessarily correlate to intelligence. And what I mean by that is that just like with the non-autistic population, we have people all over the intellect and map you know, on the autism spectrum. And what I think is a widely varying skill set. So that 14-year-old son, I bet he's incredibly good at certain things. And then there's other things that he probably finds pretty challenging. And often with us, widely varying skill set people is that um, we may not have that much in the middle. So we tend to be a study of, uh, a study of extremes. I think that's good. And again, for uh, those of you who want a copy of the slides, I encourage you to email me, uh, mainly because uh, there's a good chance that uh, I might uh, forget or lose track of all of these questions and answers. Uh, with email, it's much easier for me to just hit the return and send it right back to you. So Magdalena, definitely send me an email at sshore.edu. I will send you the slides and anybody else who wants them send them and feel free to share as you see fit. And Joshua just put my email. I just sent it directly to Magdalena. So that's good. And Joanne's talking about the son is a self-taught coder, loves gaming, fabulous at art, digital, freehand, believes he can learn all he needs from Google and home, and he doesn't trust outsiders. Yeah, well, that can be challenging because people are very unpredictable, which is why we tend to often, we often relate better to animals and objects and people because people have unpredictable emotions. We're never quite sure what they're exactly going to do. Uh, however, you know, the good news is that there are strategies to teach autistic people to better engage with others and to do it more easily. Uh, sometimes we find interacting with others online is easier than interacting face to face. So that's a possibility too, and especially during this pandemic, uh, interacting online is uh, it's pretty much the only option these days. Also something important to keep in mind.
Well, Joanne says he's nonverbal outside of the home and prefers the company of his guinea pigs and dogs. I can certainly relate to that. Uh, we had guinea pigs, dogs, and cats. Uh, we related to them all very well. So again, using an abilities-based approach, what is he good at? And that can lead to area, future areas of study, possible employment. Uh, however, uh, you know, we do have to do a certain amount of social interaction. Uh, we have to, in order to get along, in order to do business with others. So learning how to do at least enough to do that. Uh, even if you don't like it, um, that's one of the things we have to learn. Let's see, David White, what's your background a picture of? Well, we had a snowstorm a couple of days ago, so it's just uh, outside the window you know, of my house. And you can see it's mostly gray. It looks like a, a grayscale picture, but there is a little bit of color in there. And it's actually a portion of the picture. There's several additional, several additional uh, uh, window panes. Six or more, maybe a lot more. Yeah, I think there's six in total. And it's interesting because each one of those window panes could be a separate picture unto themselves, but they also make a complete picture. And the way that uh, the way that uh, works uh, when you absorb something to become a background, it changes the resolution. Uh, you know, the aspect ratio is so that way. So as a result, you only get a little bit more than two of those uh, little window panes instead of all six. And I encourage uh, Magdalena to continue to be a pain and to continue to keep learning to do her very best to teach the young kids that she teaches or on the autism spectrum. How important is it to diagnose autism? It's earlier the better. And in fact, they've gotten it to a point where we can determine if somebody is at risk of being autistic even as early as four months. You can't determine if somebody is autistic at four months of age. But you can start seeing clues, which will then suggest that you need to start working on social interaction, uh, even at that very young age. Uh, the youngest the kids have been diagnosed, I think possibly as early as 18 months, but it's usually more solid by the time you get to. Eve Maria asked, is it more difficult for women? Yeah, I think the autism is mainly because of the conventional wisdom that you know, for every woman that's diagnosed on the spectrum, uh, we see four boys. So it's often thought of as a male, as a male disease, some people think of it as, but it's a condition, it's, it's a way of being. And in fact, I think women tend to be horribly underdiagnosed because autism uh, shows up a little bit differently in women. And also due to societal expectations, it's often not taught in women. Uh, perhaps the true ratio is more like a two to one, maybe two males for every woman, but definitely not four to one. Logan wants to know if she, if she should tell their child that she's not, that he's autistic. Well, you could start off by saying he's on the autism spectrum, which is a sort of middle ground between using identity and, and person first language. Um, but however you tell that child, uh, I think the earlier they know, the better. I was lucky in this regard because my parents used the word autism in the house for as long as I can remember. So probably since about age five and a half, 
I knew I had this thing called autism. I didn't know much about what it was. And it certainly helped explain a lot of differences. So it's better to know. And uh, that's the subject of another webinar. How do you tell your child that they're autistic? And how do you do it in a way that emphasizes the strengths and abilities, but at the same time, uh, you remain cognizant of the very real challenges that come with being autistic? Well, it's 12 o'clock and we've come to uh, the end of our time together. So I encourage you to email me any remaining questions, or if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, I believe that this recording will become available uh, online. online. I'm not sure exactly when, but I think they put all of these uh, workshops online. So you will be able to get them. All right, so for further questions, uh, feel free to email me. It's been a pleasure presenting for you. A nice big group of people, so that was good to see. And Joshua just said that they will send the link after the presentation. All right, so that's good. It will be available. Take care, and I will see you at the next webinar.